thank you all so much for coming tonight. And I, we really appreciate it. We know you have a lot of other things that you could be doing on a, this beautiful summer night. Um, this is a hot topic. Uh, socially responsible investing or environmentally uh, sound investing, accountable investing, very hot topic. It's one of the hottest investment topics in the U.S. today. About 20% of U.S. investors now invest in a socially responsible way. And that number is growing, I will show you in a minute some of the stats, but that number is growing by leaps and bounds. I learned at the Barron's Conference last year that 70% of European investors invest in a socially responsible way. And that has caused in European companies, that has caused the idea of socially responsible investing to be baked into corporate governance and corporate decision making. So it makes a difference. In the US, as you can well imagine, there aren't too many companies that want to walk away from 20% of, of investors. That would be a lot of people to walk away from. And then in addition, these values of environmental footprint, corporate accountability, diversity, they overlap strongly with the values of many millennials. And you can imagine there aren't too many companies that want to walk away from the millennial workforce. So socially responsible investing, this kind of focus, if it's of interest to you, does make a difference. So I'll start out by just saying a few words to introduce the topic. And then we have the pleasure of Brian Johnson from Calvert Funds joining us this evening. We really appreciate your presence, <coughs> Brian. Yep. And he will be doing the majority of the presentation. <coughs> Restrooms are out there to the right, just down 40 paces or so. Brian. Brian. Yep. And then uh, quite a few of our staff are here, our team are here. You want to raise your hands, Mallory, Joe. Um, you probably met Linda, our newest staff person, on the way up, Jesse. And um, so you can say some hellos and so forth. So with that, what I will do is give you just a quick sense of this topic. So the term socially responsible investing is really synonymous for what's now called ESG or impact investing. So it's really morphed over time to the idea of ESG and impact investing. I won't spend a lot of time there. I'll let Brian cover that. The history of this topic goes back to biblical times. As I say that, I, I remember, Dale, that you were a chaplain all those years. It goes back to biblical times. And it was used effectively, as many of us remember in the 1970s, by the college-based anti-apartheid movement. You remember that and how that made a difference. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was more exclusionary in the approach. Hey, we don't like sin <clears throat> stocks, we don't like alcohol, we don't like tobacco, we don't like gambling. Although I have a funny story on that. <laughs> About 25 years ago, I was working with, this was in a different job, I was working with a woman, a, a British woman out in California. And she was a socially responsible investor. So we said, what do you want to exclude from your portfolio? She said, well, tobacco for sure. Then she said, alcohol. And then she said, wait a second, I like to tip a little. <laughs> <laughs> so we did not exclude alcohol. <laughs> but that's the idea, sin stocks. Now today, more so than excluding sin stocks, the bad actors, what we're really thinking about is companies that are making a difference, companies that are having a positive impact, companies that are improving, for example, their environmental uh, footprint. A recent example would be Delta Airlines ending their affiliation with the NRA as an example after the Florida shooting. What is ESG investing? And I'll let Brian go through the detail, but this gives you a high level sense. The environmental, the social, the governance. That idea of corporate accountability is a pretty big deal, isn't it? You know, when we think about toxic debt and some factors that went into the last downturn, that's pretty important. Is socially responsible investing or ESG investing, is it a trend? Is it a big trend? Yes, it is. Almost nine trillion of assets were in socially responsible uh, focuses at the end of 2015. Over about two years after that, there was a 33% growth rate. We're now at a point where one out of every five dollars or 20% of dollars are invested in a socially responsible way. So we'll talk a little more about that. Who are the leading, 
who are the leading demographics who appreciate socially responsible investing, millennials. So at times we serve the clients, so uh, the children of our clients, and probably three quarters of them prefer, so they're not all the same, but probably three quarters of them prefer a socially responsible focus. Women, women tend to outpace men in this. And now there's a new demographic. The same people that are taking over Facebook, grandparents, who are thinking about how do we protect the earth, how do we protect society when it comes to our children and grandchildren. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Brian. Yeah, thanks. Great job. I think that's a, a great overview. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Brian Johnson. Um, <coughs> thanks for having me tonight. And then, like, uh, Laura was saying this is a, 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 a really kind of an exciting topic and I know um, us at Calvert are excited to share the story with you tonight. So tonight um, the presentation um, should, should last about uh, 30, 35 minutes and it's interactive and one of the things I like to do when I present is treat this more like um, Sunday school rather than church. And what do I mean by that is I hope you ask some questions um, when I'm presenting instead of waiting till the end. So I'll just share a little story. So. Um, I just lived down the street in Edina. I have two little kids. Uh, I have a nine and a seven-year-old, and uh, my wife Betsy's a teacher over in uh, Bloomington. And I had this conversation with her about a month ago, and I said, "Hey, if I ever got hit by a bus tomorrow, um, you know, and, and you got your life and insurance money, um, how would you invest? Would would, would socially res if if the performance was the same?" Would socially responsible be an important um, topic for you to, to invest that way? And she looked at me uh, almost like, uh, well, no, no. she said basically, well, who wouldn't? If the performance is the same, why, why wouldn't you want to invest that way? And I think you're going to see some of the statistics we're going to show you um, that performance has gotten a lot better. Um, and, and what you're going to see in a little bit is um, that companies now are actually releasing their ESG metrics or their social responsible metrics, where even five years ago it was very minimal um, companies that actually did that. It was basically about 20% and today it's about 80%. I have to give uh, Laura and her team a big uh, kudos because right now there's only 6% of advisors that actually offer socially responsible investing. And what we have found at uh, Calvert is about 70% of clients actually want some type of social responsible. And I think the, the big disconnect is that a lot of advisors don't have the conversation or ask the right questions. And um, I was sitting with, a, with an advisor uh, a couple weeks ago and we, we, I, I shared that stat with him. And he's like, you know, I started asking the question to my clients and my, and my client's response was, well, don't you already invest socially responsible for, for me already? And that kind of um, made this gentleman kind of think a little bit more about his practice. So. Here's a little bit about uh, the agenda tonight. We're going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the, the change. Um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, inform, enhancing your investment returns, and then a little bit more about empowerment and what companies are really doing to, again, talk about what's going on and, and almost treat uh, social responsible investing as a risk management tool. So let's talk a little bit about the change. So this is going to be the interactive part. Um, that I need you guys to participate in. Sorry, I was a little behind on that. So companies are changing. So this is, uh, we're gonna play a game called Guess the Company. So um, this is a CEO of a company. I'm just gonna um, read a few quotes by the CEO and then you guys are gonna have to guess the company. <laughs> so this uh, seismic shift are really about the changing demographics. So pay attention to the bold and I think that's kind of will um, uh, highlight what we're trying to get across here in the world and the change in the family composition. There's also a major shift to health and well-being, which we believe is being manifested in fresh food and organic food. So taking all of these shifts into account, our purpose becomes an anchor in a sea of change. Which uh, company do you think that is? All of them. <laughs> I think that's a good guess. I have no idea. <laughs> Nabisco. Anybody else? I'm going for Nabisco. Think so. Campbell's. Yeah. Think so. <laughs> 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 
You guys might recognize this gentleman if you're local. So uh, again, we're gonna play guess the company again. We've uh, taken a number of actions in the sustainability arena because the sustainability is an important business imperative for us. We know that in order to feed a growing global population, we have to be good stewards of our earth from the farm to fork to beyond. We need clean water, healthy soil, strong ecosystems, a stable climate, thriving farm communities. Gentlemen. Check out the A, might give you a hint. <laughs> from the very beginning, our company has always been passionate about what we do in addition and how we do it. The what we do is we have an impact on every form of communication that's out there. The how we do it is about giving back <coughs> to all the communities that we are part of, and that's where social responsible is such an amazing part of fabric of the culture. Hmm. Hmm. In technology. Adobe? Adobe. Hmm. So anyway, can you imagine CEOs talking this way even 10 years ago, which they really haven't. And if you think about what's going on with the 24 hours news cycle, social media, I mean, we find something going on every single day. I'll give you, you know, what we saw with Facebook, right? Facebook, I mean, that, that was a, a big uh, uh, breach of confidence, I would say, with, with, the, with the company. And I can tell you at Calvert, when, when that news came out, we actually uh, sold uh, all our shares of Facebook because we thought that was a breach of trust. Why the change? And again, <coughs> so um, think about Citibank or Citigroup. I mean, these guys really had a tough time in the financial crisis. I mean, they were kind of the poster child of uh, kind of subprime lending with some other folks as well. But if you look at where we've come from, you know, I mean, 2008 to 2018, 10 years ago, now you can see uh, what Citibank is doing as far as Citigroup what they're doing in the social responsible arena. So now they're uh, big into uh, accessing small business financing. Uh, 2016, Citigroup lending in the US increased uh, to more than 11 billion, launched a two year, 20 million initiative to support local organizations supporting sustainable cities. Since 2012, nearly 60 billion in lending. So again, think about how far they've come in, in, in roughly 10 years, which I think is fascinating. So uh, my sister lives out in Victoria, and uh, she works at Apple, and uh, she's been there for about 10 years, but she might as well live in Carpentino because she's never home. But what, what's amazing, and this you'll see this in a minute, is they just put a, a, a headquarters up that cost $5 billion. And I don't know, has, has anybody seen the headquarters? It's in a circle. It's pretty cool. If you get a chance, Google it. Um, in Minnesota? Uh, no, it's in uh, Carpentino, uh, California. Oh, but uh, that's where their headquarters are. So um, they just they spent a lot of money Victoria. on there. Vic, uh, Victoria, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. out by um, yeah. kind of by Watertown Is and uh, Chaska. No, she lives here, but she's on a plane all the time. Okay. So yeah, um, she, but I was just instead of being on a plane, she should probably live in California. Oh. It's kind of my anyway. But um, she works from home. She works from home, or she works. All of them. Anyway. And so this, 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 you'll see this in a minute. But in 2015, 93% of Apple's energy came from uh, renewable sources. Apple has a goal of reaching 100% renewable energy use. And this is where uh, the headquarters. So that five billion dollar uh, headquarters that they just put in, they did 1.5 billion in green bonds to finance clean energy products. Basically, what green bonds are is um, they're environmentally friendly bonds. So they'll issue debt, and because they wanted to make this uh, headquarters really environmentally friendly, they issued about $1.5 billion to help uh, finance this, and this was the largest green bond issued by um, any U.S. corporation. So the largest company in the world is on board with social response and doing better um, for society. Um, so I think that's a telltale sign. So here's another example. Again, we just want to show you what companies are doing compared to where they were even, you know, 10 years ago. Capital One works with local developers to invest in affordable rental housing and create jobs. In 2015, the company provided $1.4 billion uh, in loans and investments. 
These created more than 11,000 safe, affordable places to live and also created 13,000 13, uh, jobs. So again, Capital One is on board. Um, and like Laura said, uh, information available drives transparency. So companies are being a lot more transparent about what they're doing for the greater good of society. One of my competitors out there, I don't know if you guys are familiar with BlackRock. BlackRock manages about $5 trillion. They're, I don't know if they're the number one or number two um, asset manager uh, in the US. Larry Fink, who's the CEO um, of BlackRock, came out and basically said, if, if your companies aren't doing good for society, we don't want to invest with you. So that's a huge statement coming from the, one of the largest asset managers out there. So if, if you can't have BlackRock kind of endorse you, that's a big deal. So again, another reason why companies are really cognizant about making sure um, that they're doing a little bit better for society, having a little bit more diversity, cons uh, conscious about climate change. I mean, we've got one of the greatest stewards in our backyard with Target. I mean, they've been on board with this um, for a while, and uh, I think companies will continue to follow down that path. So, um, Laura talked a little bit, uh, she kind of gave you high level, so we'll just, uh, we'll kind of get into these definitions. So, sustainable. Sustainable, uh, meeting presence needs without compromising uh, future uh, abilities. ESG, environmental, social, and corporate <coughs> governance. Again, corporate governance, what a, what a big thing that we're seeing. <coughs> Facebook, we saw that last week. That's kind of a big corporate governance uh, breach of trust. See you later. We, we don't really want to um, be involved with that. Responsible investing for impact, not just in performance. What is ESG? So just a couple of things I'll just highlight. Um, so environmental, um, obviously climate change, supply chain, energy management, social, product safety, consumer uh, uh, data security, um, employee health and, sa and safety, um, diversity. We're seeing a lot more uh, companies be more cognizant about who they're electing to their board of directors. Governance, and this should just be um, a constant for all companies. Again, corporate governance, business ethics, of course, <coughs> accounting policies, um, gender diversity. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So I'll just kind of show you how this is kind of metamorphosis of, over the last uh, uh, few years. So the big thing that we're finding at Calvert right now is we can do a lot of research on company and the materiality of uh, what companies are doing with their environmental and their social and their governance metrics. Even uh, seven years ago, 80% of companies did not report their ESG metrics. So it was very hard to put together a portfolio. So like Laura said, basically the old way of putting a social responsible portfolio was no gambling, no tobacco, no alcohol, um, and no weapons, and here you go. Now that's changed. We use dozens and dozens of sources to put together a, a portfolio uh, or, um, uh, with companies. So there's a lot more <coughs> metrics we can actually um, do research on. I would equate it like this. If you think about how um, mutual fund managers or investment managers put together portfolios, they look at stock research. And if you're an ESG manager trying to put together a portfolio of ESG friendly companies and you didn't have the ESG metrics, you really couldn't put together a really good portfolio because you really didn't know what kind of ESG had the impact um, on those, or the metrics had on uh, the, the uh, bottom line of these companies. Now, you'll see how this has really changed. So, fast forward um, to 2016, and I think it's even more now, roughly 82% of all companies now in the S&P 500 are reporting on their ESG metrics. So now, it's much easier to do the research on uh, socially responsible uh, investing than it was you know, even seven years ago. Enhancing the investment management process. So a couple of things we're going to look at is investment performance. And the impact <coughs> of performance is, um, we did a, a study here, 18-year um, study of 180 companies, and we basically looked at the highest, the highest sustainability companies and the lowest sustainability companies, and we wanted to see how this really shook out as far as performance. And uh, this gentleman um, from Harvard Business School, here's a quote from him. 
Uh, we provide evidence that high sustainability companies significantly outperform their low sustainability counterparts over the long term, both in terms of stock market as well as accounting performance. So you're gonna see more and more of this. Again, I, I would even just look at a bare minimum of SRI as a risk management tool more than anything. Um, you know, trying to stay out of the news, staying out of the paper, um, those type of things. An exhaustive analysis of over 2,200 individual studies related to ESG and corporate <clears throat> financial performance through 2014. Evidence for the business case of ESG investing, this finding co contrasts with common perception among investors. So again, I think this gets back to my earlier comments. Only 6% of advisors are offering this right now because I think uh, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, there was this perception that ESG friendly companies couldn't really perform. And I think that, that, as you can see by the evidence, that's really changed. So now if the performance has gotten better, why wouldn't you invest in something that's doing for the greater good of society? ESG outperformance opportunities um, exist in many areas of, of the market. And this holds true for North America, emerging markets and non-equity asset classes. One of the things that's great about working at uh, Calvert is um, you know, we have anything from international to bonds to domestic equity to some of the alternative stuff um, that again are all ESG friendly. ESG focused research, these are again um, the pillars of uh, Calvert. Um, uh, financial materiality. So if these ESG metrics are, are a little bit different, um, for what kind of companies, what kind of businesses they're in. And we'll show you an example here. Um, materiality is about uh, relevance. Example, I'll let you guys guess. John has never had a speeding ticket, a parking ticket, an accident, or a traffic violation. Do you think Joe's a pretty good uh, driver? <laughs> Maybe? He just never got caught. Never got caught. <laughs> what happens if Joe doesn't have a license? He was a teenager. This <laughs> <laughs> his first try out. Yeah. Which ESG uh, efforts actually deliver financial results? Can a company's businesses processes be meaningful and improved? So we're going to play again a little game here. Carbon emissions. So which of these companies is going to have more of a higher materiality to, to potentially having carbon emissions to companies that have a lower materiality of carbon emissions. So the companies, and again, this is another interactive, so please uh, please play along. Um, we have Southwest Airlines, Capital One, and Kimberly Clark. So which one has the lowest carbon emissions and which one has the highest? Capital One. So A, who, who, who thinks? Uh, Capital One. Capital One, A? Yeah. B. Got a smart group here. So again, materiality, right? Southwest Airlines. Okay, workplace workplace safety. We've got McDonald's, Microsoft, and BHP Billiton. So who's got low materiality or low potential for workplace safety, and who has a little bit more risk? as far as their employees working out in the field or in the store. So who wants, who wants to guess A? Low chance of getting hurt. Microsoft. 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 B? Microsoft. Microsoft. B? Microsoft. C? Microsoft. Smart group here. Oh. That makes sense. OK, we've got uh, water stewardship. People always get this one wrong, by the way. <laughs> so low water usage, high water usage. Citibank or Citigroup, Intel, and International Paper. So who, who uses the least amount of water? Citigroup. Citigroup. Okay, who's in the middle? Intel. International Paper. Intel. Who says Intel? Middle. Who says IP? International Paper. Intel uses a lot of water. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. They're cognizant of it, though. <clears throat> anyway, so the, so that's kind of the point we're trying to get. We got to make sure that these ESG um, metrics are material to uh, the companies or what type of industry they're in. Engagement with management. 
A responsible investment should exercise shareholder rights to actively engage in company management to help drive performance. Trivia question. How much, in dollar terms, of stock do you think you need to own to file a resolution with a public company? So if you want to ha file a resolution what with a company, is? how much stock in dollar terms do you think you need to own? What's a resolution? A resolution, um, you want to talk to them because you don't like the way their board oh. is made up or you don't like their um, sustainability uh, uh, issues they didn't plant enough trees or they use too much water. Or, yeah. So you want to go to the shareholder meeting shareholder and meeting. an idea. Yep. I want to say, I'd like your company to uh, conserve more water. Mm -hmm. One share. One share. One share. A dollar terms. You might need dollar terms. Yeah. 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 Let's they may not pay attention to you. It depends what the stock's worth. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It depends. What, but give me a dollar. So a dollar to a million dollars. What do you think you need to know? A dollar. A dollar? A dollar? Mm -hmm. Well, this is the lowest group that's ever guessed. It's 2500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so engagement. Meeting with company management, like Joe was talking about. Instigate change in discussion and negotiation. Four measures that are responsible, against measures that are not responsible, or against uh, hostile uh, directors. Filing shareholder resolutions. Mm -hmm. So I will tell you, where I work at Calvert, we are the number one voting um, mutual fund company um, in the US. So we might not be the biggest, but we're the most active. Um, so we make sure we vote all our proxies. A lot of our competitors out there <coughs> don't. Um, and again, that's kind of how people were founded, um, is making sure that um, we want to be very uh, vocal with what we want, and we, we vote all our proxies, we file resolutions all the time. Um, so we're pretty proud of that at Calvert. Advancing public policy initiatives. Here's another engagement uh, example, and this is uh, PepsiCo. Global supply chain and distribution network, human rights and agricultural supply chains, labor rights and community bottling plants. Mm -hmm. Leading responsible investors started in 2010, um, emphasized the need for PepsiCo to manage supply chain risks, focus on labor rights even in bottling plants not owned by uh, PepsiCo. Results, nearly 250,000 uh, employees trained on human rights <coughs> policy of global, 88% of all key suppliers trained on suppliers and sustainable farming initiative, addressing human right issues in sugar and palm oil uh, supply chains. So again, um, you know, this is an engagement talking to shareholder or talking to uh, management, filing resolutions, and uh, you can see what what happened here. So that was a success. Yeah, Brian, if I may, so yeah. that's an example of the research that's going on. So not only do they look at the companies, but they look at their supply chains all the way down. That's well, right. You might remember Nike, you know, offshore. There were teenagers doing that. So in their research, when they do these screens, they're they're talking to the companies, they're talking to their suppliers, their vendors, their competitors which is a kind of a cool when they, when they do that broader inclusionary approach. That's the screening that we're talking about. Which was much different than the exclusionary, no right. tobacco, no weapons, no. Right. That's a good point, Joe. This one blows me away. How many of you guys shop at Amazon? Sure. Most, right? Yeah. Okay, this, this just blows me away. I've shopped at Amazon while you're talking. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Scott. Amazon guy, I think he's at our house every day. So we all know uh, Amazon, think of all the energy use at data centers, warehouses, shipping operations. Just a few years ago, Amazon had no disclosure on climate change or energy, which again, just blows me away. They had a leading responsible investor file proposals in 2011, 2012, 2013. Despite support of 20% of shareholders in 2011, Amazon did nothing. Despite of uh, support of 21 shareholders, 21 percent of shareholders in 2012, Amazon did nothing again. Recent action: In 2013, Amazon finally agreed to address climate change, energy, and sustainability issues. In 2014, Amazon finally hired a global uh, director of sustainability. So again, think about Amazon: the boxes, the energy, the servers, the water usage. I don't know how many employees work there, but it's a lot. Um, so to me, that's just, again, kind of sign of the times. They better get going on that. Impact reporting. Uh, responsible investment should measure and report all material uh, impacts. So this is a good thing we do at Calvert, I know. 
how does your uh, responsible investments compare? What's their fossil fuel reserves? What's their carbon emissions? What's their toxic emissions? What's their water usage? What are they doing about climate change? What are they doing about gender pay equality? This is some of the stuff I was telling you that 81% of S&P 500 companies now report on, and you can actually do the research. Five years ago, or I'm sorry, seven years ago, that was only 20%. So now, again, we can put together a more inclusionary uh, portfolio. Empowering uh, investors for change. So I guess you have to ask yourself, and I, again, I have to give kudos to Laurel Wealth Management, or planning, uh, Laurel Wealth Planning and their team because they've done a phenomenal job and they are so ahead of the curve of most of the folks we talk to um, because they've been doing this for, uh, for many, many years. Um, you know, some of the passions are separate from your investment portfolio. Um, you know, mountain biking, I know Joe and I were just talking about that, quilting, um, photography, some of the things you passionately support, some of the things you oppose, do you even care what you own? Investors have a lot of choices. Managers can exclude um, industries in conflict with their values. So tobacco, weapons, polluters. Investment managers who don't exercise their uh, shareholder rights or their shareholder responsibilities may see outflows. Again, think of BlackRock like I talked to one of the biggest uh, asset managers out there. Um, investment managers like Calvert amplify the individual investors' voices. Um, Investment managers can influence the companies they own. Investment managers, again, we file a lot of resolutions at Calvert. Investment managers can encourage corporate leaders to adopt different policies or change business practices, think, think Amazon. As companies improve, they may increase value and reward investors who own their shares. And we'll uh, do a couple more guests to companies. Treat and return as approximately 80% of its water withdrawals to local communities. Since 1998 has conserved enough water to sustain 520,000 U.S. homes for an entire year. In 2016, established a 2020 water goal, invest in new global water conservation projects that are expected to save about 1.2 billion of gallons of water per year. General Motors, Intel, Johnson & Johnson, or Boeing? Any other guesses? <coughs> Would Boeing reuse their water? I don't know. <laughs> when they wash the planes. <laughs> Think service. Intel. 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 So they've gotten better, right? That's cool. That's the company. Supports 248 water projects in 2,000 <clears throat> communities in 71 countries. Perfect score on human rights campaigns, annual corporate equality index for 11 consecutive years. Provides 2 million people in Africa with a sustainable, safe water access with a 2020 goal of an additional 4 million. That's the company. Hmm. Microsoft. Oh. Walmart. Go oh. Oh. <laughs> One last uh, guess the company. Distributed 129 million coffee uh, plantlets. Um, 2010 through 2016, the farmers against a target of uh, 220 million by 2020. Trained 363 rural farmers through uh, capacity building programs. Trained 15,000 uh, women in business and entrepreneurial skills. No one ever gets this one right. Green Mountains. Green Mountains, I think, owned by Starbucks now. Oh, yes. Next question. Yeah. Guess Nestle. Good guess. Oh, really? Yeah, because they, they had a bad reputation like in there for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Good, that's and, that, and that's a good point. A lot of people yes. might not like them and they might have a bad reputation. Yes. But a way you can be inclusive in the portfolio is if you're making strides to become more of a, a better corporate citizen. Mm -hmm. So it's not game over for these folks that might once might have been bad corporate stewards. Uh, you know, um, you know, Facebook's out now. Who knows what they'll look like in five years? We don't know. They could be back into the game. And I will pass this back over to Laura. Joe. Oh, yeah. Well, we can. You want to do questions, or you want her to wrap it up? Then we'll do no, questions. No. Oh, go ahead. Is this national or international? Some of these companies are not doing well internationally, while they're doing. They, 
Coca-Cola is not doing all that well in Central America. I mean, they've gone to great lengths to keep out any unions. Yeah, and, and I, as well as uh, Nestle is, I don't think, not doing that well internationally. I would say this. I, I, I would guarantee none of these companies are perfect, um, without a doubt. They're large, multi-billion dollar, multinational <coughs> companies. And uh, I will tell you, at Calvert, we have a pretty stringent scoring system. And th there's going to be some knocks where they're not going to be, um, you know, perfect. You know, if you got on a 4.0 sc scale, but they might be three three out of four, and that might be good enough to be a good ESG company. So yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, but are you looking at it overall, or are you just... Is we're looking a, at it overall. We're, again, we, we live in a global world, and um, you know, at Calvert, we have, you know, we own a, we have a emerging market fund, we have an international mm -hmm. fund, we've got... Um, so I think this is, these guys might or may, might not be in the portfolio at all times. I think more importantly, the presentation shows that uh, these companies are actually trying to be uh, better corporate uh, stewards or more ESG friendly than they have been even five or six years ago. Um, and a lot of that comes down to uh, just, again, I think the, the, the news cycle, um, the world's changing a lot faster, staying out of the news, being uh, you know, a little bit more cognizant about diversity and um, gender equality, all that type of stuff. So yeah, I think it's a fair point that you're making. I would say that, if I may, uh, it yeah. skews towards international because a lot of these firms are multinational. You, you talk about supply chains, you know, they're global. But the progress might be incremental. So there's a case we didn't show where there was shareholder advoc advocacy that leaned on McDonald's to take antibodies out of their supply chain here in the U.S. They got that done. And then they said, well, what about <coughs> non-U.S. suppliers? And then a couple years later, they got that done. So I think. The efforts there, you know, how, how far they, they get, they get more points as they go through. But certainly, when these companies look at it, they're being encouraged to look at it on their global footprint. And it's definitely a fluid uh, experience, I know, from our asset managers, because things can change. They might be, like McDonald's, I know, is in our portfolio. Now they're out of our portfolio. Facebook, same type of thing. Um, Again, it's constantly fluid. We're constantly monitoring it, and that's kind of where we use our dozens and dozens of sources. Um, but I, I do think overall companies are trying to do a little bit better, and I think that's what some of the examples we're showing. But I think that's a fair point you made. So you know, you do a lot of really careful research, which is, which is great. But the question is, is, you know, as this sort of becomes more attractive, are, are, are there any sort of standardized criteria in terms of what's social investing or not? Or you know, you could see investment firms saying, oh. We do social investing, uh, but but in fact, they, it could be hocus have, pocus. They might not have a big research process. Yes. Yeah, so, is there some sort of I don't know accrediting body or standardized criteria? That is that a fantastic it? question. So, if you guys are familiar with FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Boards, they have a thing called SASB. So, it's a Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. Um, now, the the one thing that um, social responsible investing is lacking right now is none of this data is audited. So when I get data, it's all self-reported. Mm -hmm. I think if you fast forward in a decade, there'll probably be a little bit more audit me measures out there. So um, SASB is, is, is kind of the first step in kind of getting there. Um, so we're, we're definitely not there yet. Um, because again, this is all unaudited and there's really, um, they can say this, but um, mm -hmm. hopefully our research does a good job of kind of sniffing out the bad actors. Um, and I will say that I think a lot of, you'll see um, asset managers kind of coming in, some of my competitors out there, that might be onesie, twosie type of asset managers. We, we have a sort of one strategy, but they don't kind of live it, eat it, breathe it like Calvert does. And there are some other company, great companies that we work, PAX is another one, Parnassus mm -hmm. is another one. They're true kind of uh, social responsible investors. But I think that's a great, I, I don't, we're definitely not there. And I think if we did fast forward uh, a decade from now, They'll probably be a little bit more um, standardized type of metrics, and um, um, but I think that's a great point you made. And the other question you mentioned, you know, you were talking earlier about kind of, you know, some deal breakers like you know, other alcohol, tobacco, guns. Do, do you also have sort of like deal breakers when you invest? In I think tobacco is an absolute deal breaker, without a doubt. I don't think there's any way Philip Morris or British Tobacco is ever going to be in the social responsible. Um, gun manufacturers is another. Um, uh, I think that's always going to be a deal breaker. I don't even know if there's that many public gun makers left. I'm not. I'm not. You know, Smith and Weston was 
bought by private equity. Um, cool. Uh, I would say those two, um, for sure, are absolute no chance, no how, no, no way. Get back to your, your first question, Alan, if I may. Um, it's new, it's evolving, so that, that uniform criteria is not there yet. But you'll see the industry, they're looking at a couple different things. They're looking at the UN. The UN has like 17 different criteria that they're starting to borrow from that. And we'll also talk about Morningstar, who many of you know, the independent you know, uh, research arm. They just bought a company that's called Sustain Analytics that is now applying their key performance indicators on these. So we'll talk about, you know, just as you see the five-star ratings within Morningstar, you'll start to see five, one to five globes. So they're making their cuts at it. But you're right, it hasn't been uniform yet, but I think that's just an indication of how new this, this is, is happening and how quickly it's happening. And you'll see Morningstar now, if you, you know, pull up Morningstar and you put a stock ticker in there, you'll see their sustainability score, which, uh, like Joe was saying, they bought, bought a company called Sustainable, Sustainable, I can never say it, Sustainable Analytics. Analytics. Yeah. Uh, tongue twister. Yeah? In order to, uh, to vest it, um, Facebook, that means you held it. Yep. And you held it on the basis, I presume, of some ESG analysis. Correct. Um, obviously, it was flawed. Yep. And yet, I think it was 2011, there was a lawsuit, a successful one, against um, Facebook for its uh, data handling practices. Sure. So the question becomes you know, just how valid is the analysis if, you know, a big problem like Facebook can get through it. Yeah, I mean, again, I think um, when, when we do um, our research, there's, we use dozens and dozens of sources, and we come up with a score. And again, on a four-point scale, Facebook might have been a, a three, and that might have been good enough to get into the, into the, the portfolio. Um, in reality, it probably was a two, and we probably missed that. Um, and then once more information became available, we uh, uh, made a conscious decision to sell Facebook uh, because of uh, a little bit more information and maybe the information wasn't as prevalent as Cambridge uh, Analytics came out. Um, so I think it's a fair point. Um, I'd be a little bit more inclined to be like, you know, if Facebook was a four out of four and we didn't, you know, really look at, uh, we didn't bring that into account. Um, I think I'd be a little bit more um, concerned about that. But yeah, I think all their other corporate go governance was pretty good. You know, maybe their board of directors look good. Their um, inclusivity, their uh, you know uh, energy usage, that was probably good enough to get it. Data security, um, you know, was probably not 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 to the point where it was today. So, and that obviously that was a deal breaker. And again, it's. These things are fluid, kind of fluid uh, uh, situations, and you know we reacted, I think, appropriately at the time. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so when I was chatting with um, an attorney about this, and this isn't anything about attorneys, I'll hear that. No, I was chatting with an attorney about this, and he said, "Well, Laura, don't." All companies care about diversity. Don't all companies care about their environmental mm -hmm. footprint these days? I mean, is this really anything different mm -hmm. than what companies care about in general? So I have an opinion on that, but why don't you go ahead? Um, do I think all companies care? I don't think so. No. I don't think we're there yet. <clears throat> I, I think uh, um, you hope, you would hope, it, it is 2018. But um, the companies are carrying what? Carrying about what? Well, a lot of it was they're going to make a profit, and, or going to be nice neighbors, or all of the above. Well, you would you would you would hope all of the above in, in, in some regards, where I think you can make a really a really nice profit, but also care about and have some type of values and corporate structure and uh, corporate governance and cognizant about diversity and. I'm sure there's a lot of companies that all we want to do, number one, is make a profit. And yeah. Make a profit. F yeah. I don't care where it's coming from, just make a profit. Sure. And But you don't like those companies. 
Well, I can't say that. Well, no, no, we, 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 no, we, we would hope there's a little bit more to the company yeah. than just strictly right. the bottom line right. at Calvert. So, um, so is it you know absolutely all companies you know care about diversity? I would say no, uh, which is really unfortunate. But I think there's um, again, um, if you look at the risk management, if, if you don't care. And uh, I think you could be in really, you could be out of business if you, if you don't care, um, because it is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. Mm -hmm. What was it? What, 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 what's your thoughts on it, Laura? Well, I think there's a lot of talk out there. Yeah. And then the question is, what's the law? Yeah. But if you go back to 80% of those companies now reporting on ESG yeah. stuff, yeah. I mean, this is a competitive advantage. If you think about those comments by the CEOs, right? You couldn't guess Campbell Soup, you know. Concern, is concerned about the family structure. General Mills is, think, is concerned about thriving farm communities and water. Roll that back 10 years and ask the CEO then of General Mills. He's like, water what? You know, families why? Yeah. So I think, I think these companies that get it now realize it's, it's not a unilateral decision, right? You, mm -hmm. you can have good results and be, and be a good neighbor. They're, they're not mutually exclusive if, if done right. And those that get it, know the appeal to that for companies like Calvert that go there or individual shareholders that really say we want to change out of this otherwise we're gonna you know Calvert and BlackRock this just trillions of dollars can go away if they don't have the right conversation that's a and that's and that's some of the conversation we have at Calvert with management if we some if we see something we don't like maybe they're uh, maybe they don't care about diversity as much well we're gonna file a resolution and uh, and have that conversation with them uh, because again, we live in this world. We do the research every single day. We we have benchmarks on other companies and where they're sitting. So it's not like um, we don't know what we're doing from from that standpoint. Again, this is kind of our our passion and what what we're the the world we're living in. Yeah. You spoke about Calvert a number of times. I don't know that company. What is your company? What does it do? Um, so I work for um, so I work for Eaton Vance. Um, it's a mutual fund company in Calvert. So Calvert is a mutual fund company in Eaton Vance. So uh, Eaton Vance actually owns Calvert. So we are a big asset manager uh, in Boston, and uh, kind of we do have offices kind of all over the globe. But our headquarters are out of Boston and uh, in Maryland. So um, we actually have an office here in Edina as well. So. Um, yeah, so we were, we're an asset manager. Thank you. Sure. And the appeal, you'll see this a couple different times, the appeal of Calvert's a social responsible, they, that's what they've been doing all the time, there's a couple other ones, but big companies like Eaton Vance are seeing the appeal of that, so you'll see these pairings of a big company snapping up these social responsible uh, fund companies because they, they get the sense of what's going on here. So it'll only mean good things because, again, that's greater economies of scale yep. bringing this to the forefront. And, and uh, it's a good thing for Eaton Vance too, because we're, we're learning, uh, Eaton Vance is learning a lot from Calvert. So uh, Eaton Vance wasn't traditionally social responsible, but uh, I, I would say we're making stri more strides um, every single day um, by being a little bit more social responsible and, and learning from Calvert. Yeah. I remember, you know, my father talking about, you know, business and supply and demand, and that was the marketplace, and the market drives because of supply and demand. And it's very, uh, it's very positive for me to hear that in this case, market is driving change and accountability. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big shift. Mm -hmm. It is. It's a big shift. It is. Mm -hmm. Again, if we can't appeal to the next generation and, you know, I look at my kids who are seven and nine. They're growing up a lot different. You know, I'm 45. They, they're growing up a lot different than I am. And uh, if you can't appeal to that kind of next generation and the way they're growing up, you're going to be out of business. And uh, it's going to be important uh, uh, to be able to, uh, um, again, um, work with those uh, with with the, with the younger generation. I'm not saying to exclude all the other generations, but again. I think that the, the, the folks and millennials are growing up much different than, than I did. I know that. Well, they have electricity. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That outhouse I had growing up was really tough. <laughs> Uphill both ways. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to have uh, Laura back clean up here. <laughs> <laughs>